Hello. Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you all had a, had a pleasant lunch. Uh, so welcome back to the first track, uh, the first afternoon speak of track two. So today we have David Plumpton who is going to be talking about putting the fun back into functional with Lambda Calculus. Uh, he is a senior developer, senior developer at Solnet Solutions. Uh, so David, take it away. Uh, round of applause please before we get started actually. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, how are we doing for sound? That sounds pretty good. All right, uh, well, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we, as you may have seen, we've got some uh, pretty good-looking uh, sessions uh, <laughs> in the other rooms, so uh, no pressure. <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, my talk is putting the fun back into functional with Lambda Calculus. Um, briefly uh, about me, I work for Solnet, worked for them for quite a few years, and my day job is, is mostly Java work, um, typically uh, in the integration space. Uh, I, I do some JavaScript, but not a lot in, in general. And a lot of my personal interest in uh, functional programming comes through uh, Clojure and ClojureScript. And I'm at David Plumpton on Twitter. OK, so what am I going to be talking about today? Um, First, I'll be going into the, the history of uh, Lambda Calculus um, a little, and then really trying to drill down into what it is, how it works, and working through some specific examples so that you can get a feel for what exactly um, it, it does. And uh, then we'll make some outrageous comparisons. So, it starts with this guy, Alonzo Church. Uh, pretty uh, fun looking guy from the photo there, I guess. And um, he was an American mathematician, uh, so he lived from 1903 to 1995. And uh, he, he taught at quite an array of different uh, universities there. Um, but in particular, he was investigating the foundations of maths in the 1930s. And you may have seen his name already uh, as part of the Church Turing thesis. So there were actually quite a few uh, earlier versions of Lambda Calculus, um, but many of them were found to be vulnerable to some zero-day exploits injected by the CIA. And uh, it was in 1936 that the, the version that we're going to talk about today, um, that a paper was published describing that, and it, it's known as the untyped Lambda Calculus, but we'll just be calling it Lambda Calculus. So I think it's worth just quickly uh, asking the question, why the name? Um, it does seem like a bit of an unusual name. And as, as part of his work, um, in his notation, he would write uh, a little hat above uh, some of the symbols. So just like a circumflex character. And there came a time when he actually needed to go to a typesetter and start publishing his papers, and that was just a bit awkward in those days, so he wanted to move that down just in front of the character. And it seems that somehow the typesetter may have interpreted that interpreted that as a capital lambda, and then at some later stage actually changed it to a lowercase lambda. So really the whole name is arguably just a typographical error. Um, <laughs> so maybe that's not so scary after all. Okay, so how can we explain what is it? So my suggestion is let's do what nerds do best. Um, Let's create an imaginary universe that we control, and what we're going to do is try to figure out exactly the right things to put into that universe. Um, so we start with an empty universe. But don't put anything in there yet. One of the, the key points is we're going to try to put in, we're going to try and challenge ourselves uh, to be putting in the absolute least amount of stuff that we can get away with. So it's going to be the, a very, very simple universe indeed. But of course, we still want to make it useful. Um, the whole point is to be able to do something that's arguably useful. 
So, you probably already suspect it's going to be about functions and um, what really is a function? Well, it's a set of mappings from inputs to outputs where a given input always maps to the same output. So, no surprises there. But since we're emphasizing simplicity, let's try to start with what we might think is the simplest possible function. So, we're going to put into our universe function of a equals zero. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? How could we go wrong with that? But when we think about f of a equals zero, just that expression brings in a whole bunch of things with it. Sure, we have the concept of functions, and we knew that we were going to be having functions, so that seems okay. If we think about it, we've got a name for that function, which I've just written here as f. Okay, we'll, call, we'll put a name into our universe for now. And we've got something we call a, again, another name. And there's a zero. And then when we think about zero, we realize that actually that really drags in the entire concept of numbers in the first place. So just f of a equals zero, really there's a lot in there. So let's just throw that universe out and we'll get a whole fresh universe. And that's okay because they come in packs of 12. So this time we're just going to try and make an even simpler function. So since the zero seemed to be a bit of a problem, how can we get rid of that? And perhaps the most obvious way is to simply return the same result that we passed in as a parameter. We're just going to reuse that parameter. And, well, at least now we've completely managed to avoid numbers. Still some other things floating around in there, and one of them is, is really that concept of f, that name. So can we do something to just leave out names? So one more universe. And we're going to, this time, try a, pretty much the same thing, but with some new notation. And here is that new notation. So what's happening here? So this really means that we're going to create a new function with some parameter called a and return it as a result. And that is fundamentally what that lambda notation means is create a new function. In this notation, the dot that's sitting in there just serves to separate uh, the parameter from the body. So there's nothing else mysterious that's happening with that. Maybe we could have used the space or something, but they've used the dot. So what, what's in our universe now? We've got functions, and we've got parameters. We've got this new lambda thingamy that creates functions for us. But what happens when we would like when we would call a function? How, what's our notation for that? And the notation they've chosen is simply to put to write two things next to each other. So in this case, we have a and b. And if we have something that we're referring to as a, uh, which so far has to be a function because that's pretty much all we've got, and we put another thing next to it called b, then that notation means that we are calling A and passing in B. We don't necessarily have to have any brackets or any other part of the notation if we don't want to. And you might wonder how that extends as such. Well, if we have a few things in a row, what that really means is that we are continuing the same process over and over. So this would mean that we have something called A and we call it with by passing in b, that returns something that is a function, we then call that by passing in c. Again, that returns a function, and we, recall, we call that new function by passing in d, and the whole thing returns another function result. So, that's all very well, but when we say we'd like to pass in a parameter as we call a function, what is it? What, what could that B actually be? We're here we're just calling something B, but we'd like to know what that actually is. 
And since we have so few things in our universe, what we're going to do is call the function, and we're just going to pass in the only thing we have, another function, as the argument. So now we're calling a function, passing in a function, and returning a function, which is probably starting to sound pretty familiar for certain kinds of modern programming. But is there anything else we can do uh, in the body of a function? And uh, one option we have is to just continue with the same sort of notation, and we can create another function. So what we're looking at here is a little expression that says uh, the function we're creating that takes a parameter a, in its body, it creates another function which would take a parameter b, and then in its body it would return that b. Now, because we have these two different parameter names so far, a or b, that actually gives us an option within that innermost function and that we could refer to b, but we could also refer to a. So um, an innermost function can refer to any of those outer enclosing parameters. So we, as we create this chain of functions, we now get some choice about what we would like to put in the body of a function. One thing we can also do is simply to call more of these functions in different ways and different combinations. So in this case, I've got A and B, and I can call them, chop them up, and call them in, in different ways here. Um, and if we think about this notation, what does that really mean? Just to clarify it a little, if we put in some uh, explicit parentheses to show where our implicit parentheses were, that would mean that within that second function, we um, are calling A and passing in B, and then take that and pass in B, and then take that and pass in A. Doesn't seem too surprising, but we do have the option of arranging the parentheses in some other way. So, again, it's not very surprising, but it's worth stating that we can simply put the parentheses in different places. But this does have the slight little wrinkle that it does really mean that we've sort of added parentheses into our universe. If you look at explanations of lambda calculus on the net, many of them seem to skip this little step. It's just sort of Im Im implied that parentheses are everywhere somehow. But uh, I'll just point that out. OK, so calling a function. Um, what does that look like? How does it work? What can we do with it? And in this simple example, we're going to see what happens when we have uh, this function on the left-hand side uh, in the first set of parentheses, and we're going to call it with the argument on the right-hand side in the second set of parentheses, which is the, the DE. And it really just comes down to simple string substitution. So if we look at that, and uh, hopefully those colors are coming out OK, what we're saying is, because we have one parameter a, um, we find where that parameter a exists in the body, and then we substitute in the value that we are passing in, which in this case is de. So looking at the result of that, that's now simply the expression b, and then in brackets, dec. So that would be a function b that we are calling, but to figure out what the parameters are, we're going to call d by passing in e, and then calling that again, passing in c, and then that take that whole thing and pass it into b. Um, right now, there's a, a little uh, shortcut that comes in, in the notation, and because we create these chains of nested functions, um, it becomes convenient to uh, have a way of notating that. So we, since true lambda calculus expressions only have one parameter, for convenience we'll, we'll write them as a lambda and then something like ABC and then the dot for the body and whatever follows in the body, but that would mean that, as you can see, a, 
a function taking A and then a function taking B and, and so on. So that's just a, a shorthand notation. Now, since we have different names, we can reuse them in different ways, as we love to copy and paste from different sources. What, what would it mean if a name clashed? In this case, we have an A on the right-hand side, but there's an initial parameter A and then another parameter A deeper in the expression. So what does that last A refer to? And again, perhaps it's no surprise, but it's just sort of lexical scoping that we have in many languages. So that's that final A is referring to the, uh, the innermost uh, A that happens to be right next to it there. And of course, one of the easiest ways to deal with this sort of thing is just to rename everything so that there are no name clashes whatsoever before you get started. And then obviously life's a bit easier. So what can it really do? Since we've only got functions, what interesting things can we actually achieve with that? We tend to think of computing as being about things like math and logic. And so we'd kind of like to know if it can do any of those things with, all we, with the small set of things we have in our mental universe so far. So let's have a look at math, for example. Given that we, we don't have any numbers, which we're probably thinking might be the tricky part, we can really just pretend that some kind of function represents zero. And of course, this is what computing is all about. We have no numbers or letters or anything in computers. It's all ones and zeros, except we don't have ones and zeros. We have little bits of current flowing around and so forth. So it seems a natural extension of that kind of thing. So what kind of function could represent a zero? And uh, this is the one that we're going to use. There's, there's two cunningly named parameters here, uh, s and z. And z is chosen because it's a zero. But we can think of the s as being a successive function. Now, in this first expression, what we see is that um, the s appears no times at all in the body. So that means we have a zero, and then we have nothing further happening with it. So unsurprisingly, that represents zero. Now this kind of thing is known as church encoding, and it continues by using the s function as many times as necessary to represent that particular number. So a one means that we will make a single call to the successor function within the body of this function expression, and the zero will be the parameter that's passed in. And we just keep nesting this as many times as is necessary. So a two is we're going to call s of s of zero, and you can see five there, and if you're doing a billion or something, you can see it's gonna be big, but the key thing to understand is it's le at least clearly possible. Um, every number will have some unique expression that represents it, so we can go from the expression to the number, and we can go from the number to the expression. Just no surprises. So we actually have to have something to be the successor function, um, and again, this sort of stuff can be done in several different ways, but this is a potential successor function that's been uh, designed. So let's have a go at this one. And we're going to use it in a little example to see if we can evaluate uh, the very, ex very simple expression of one plus zero. So if we want to actually represent that, what we want is the successor function on the left, and we want to pass in zero on the right as the parameter. And that, of course, is really literally what we're trying to achieve here. It's the successor of zero. So if we think of the form of string substitution that we looked at before, now we just have to apply that uh, for this expression. So our first parameter is a, and a appears in only one place in the body of this expression, and the zero function expression on the right is 
what we will substitute into that position. When we do that, um, the parameter part of the expression, uh, lambda ABC, simplifies a little because we've evaluated the A parameter. And all we've done is effectively cut and pasted that uh, expression on the right into the body where A was appearing. Um, one thing that's uh, worth considering here is if A appeared in multiple places, we would put it in in multiple places, and if A doesn't appear in there at all, then we just leave that uh, parameter out. Okay, so now we've got this expression, which still looks a little unwieldy. Uh, what do we do with that? Well, we don't have any we don't have any values on the right-hand side, so um, what we can do is only to simplify the body. And we can simplify the body uh, within the expression by passing the first thing in as S. S doesn't appear in the body, so that leaves us with nothing. We pass in the... Now we're going to do the similar thing for C, and that will evaluate to itself. And now if you look at that expression, it's really... Um, the same structure as the lambda of s, z um, being one call of the successor function to the zero, on, uh, onto the zero. So that is the number one. So we've added one to zero and we got one. Um, subtraction, uh, as they experimented with this stuff, turned out to be a lot trickier, trickier and you had to have two parts and one part sort of counts up and one part counts down and it took them a while to figure that out. And a guy figured it out at the dentist, one of his students, and they call it the wisdom tooth trick. So we think our problems are painful sometimes. How about logic? Um, if we'd like to have true and false uh, to make a choice with two parameters, a very simple way to represent that is a function of two parameters, with, two, with true, it returns the first parameter, with false, it returns the second parameter, so just two different uh, representations, first is true, second is false. What about, say, a not function? Here's, here's an example. Let's take not and we'll pass in a true, which is returning the first parameter on the right there. So again, we substitute that in. Uh, it appears right at the start, so that substitutes in. Now we take that expression and we can substitute in the next parameter for g. So that appears in the body. We have one more parameter on the right. So we substitute that in for h. h doesn't appear in the body anywhere, so that just leaves us with the body. So what's that? That's, um, sorry, that is lambda of b dot c. So a function of two parameters returning the second parameter, so that's false. So we've done not true, and we've evaluated to false. So you can see that it is, in fact, possible to do Boolean logic with simple, simple lambda expressions. If we want to compare all of this to a Turing machine, which is the thing we tend to learn about in university, we typically get a picture of a tape of cells with the symbols and a read-write head in some position, and there's actually a lookup table which can say things as complex as when you're in this state and you're, the cell is another state, then you move some cells in a certain direction and write another state and change to another direction. Actually has a lot of state in it, the internal state, the position of the head, and so forth. It brings me to this fantastic tweet I, I found. Wonderful. So is this actually the smallest tightest logical system ever? Well, turns out there's another thing called SKI Combinator Calculus, and everything in it is named after birds. Um, the S is a starling and the K is a kestrel, and there's all sorts of fun with combining these things together in interesting ways, but one thing it shows is that actually everything in Lambda Calculus can be built by combining just these two functions, and the first one is familiar as that true function. Um, so that's the end of our universe. Uh, we've looked at what it is and what it does. We've worked through some simple examples. We've <laughs> done an outrageous comparison with a Turing, mas mas Turing machine, and it's sort of what you see is what you get versus all the state there. 
So I hope you can take uh, some of these ideas and uh, use them to build software that has uh, nine fives of reliability and 24 divided by seven availability. I have a few links in here that I will probably be making available later, but if you Google for things like Lambda Calculus Evaluator and, 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 uh, and so forth, you all find a lot of uh, online ways to evaluate these expressions and play around with them. Quite a lot of fun there. So, any questions? Anyone? Questions? Over there. <laughs> Does it count as? Uh, it, so he, he was asking if the if the last two ex expressions. Um, I can tell you that they are known as Starling and Kestrel in SKI. I don't know what their uh, uh, official names would be in other systems. Um, since they've been shown to be fundamental, they probably have well-known names. Um, but I confess I don't know them. <laughs> but I just know that one of them looks like that, that true function that yeah. uh, we Sorry, used earlier. I actually think I'm wrong. I did see the B on the first uh, expression. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the, um, the question that you started out, is this the smallest logical system ever? Did SKI, uh, SKI Combinator Calculus say yes, or did it say that a subset of it is even more simple but sufficient? Um, from what I've looked at online, it, it seems to be an, uh, a, a logical system with the even, an even smaller number of working parts. Um, so it seems more fundamental to me. Um, but it, it, there's not many moving parts here, so there's not too much to remove. But there's a, there's a very nifty site online showing it all as sort of diagrams and s pasting diagrams into other diagrams and, and evaluating things and uh, you have to have to wonder that there's not very much there to be evaluated at all and yet it still is Turing equivalent to to any other logical system so <laughs> right thank you very much for that David Can we get a round of applause.